Today, let's talk about back pain. The reason I want to talk about back pain is one, it's very debilitating, more so than other joints may be. The second reason is that we've all felt it. It's super common, and if you haven't felt back pain at some point in your life so far, you probably will in the future. The third reason, back pain is super complex, and sometimes it can be hard to piece together why we're feeling the way that we are. Advice can often be confusing as well, so it can be really hard to find one source for a lot of good information. And as if that's not bad enough, there's also a ton of pervasive myths that you'll hear people confidently say online all the time. Things like, You should lift with your legs, not with your back. Everyone knows a neutral spine is safer. Your core is designed to resist motion, not create it. You might feel good now, but trust me, in 20 years, you'll be feeling it. In this video, I promise to explain the fear that people have and where some of these misconceptions come from, as well as giving you some specific techniques and actionable steps to be able to address or prevent back pain in the future. This is gonna allow you to create a plan to build a more resilient spine, one that's far more capable of dealing with the stressors in day-to-day -day life, whether that's just regular activities at home or a specific sport that you play. And at the end, if you're interested, I'm gonna back this up with a ton of relevant research. So first, let's talk about why the spine has become a borderline obsession for me. My name's Alex Sterner, and I own a strength and conditioning facility in San Diego, California. At my gym, Electrum Performance, I train primarily jujitsu and combat sport athletes. And within those sports, there's a huge demand placed on the spine. These athletes often have to violently twist, flex, and extend against external resistance. For that reason, back problems are super, super common. But I also train people of various other experience levels and some that don't train a sport at all. In any of these populations, back pain is super prevalent. So over the years, I've developed a strategy to be able to address those with back pain but more importantly, once we get out of that pain cycle, to build a more resilient spine so you don't constantly get stuck in that cycle. And today, I'm gonna bring that strategy to you. So let's talk about some of the general concepts that allow us to train our spine and make it more resilient. First things first, in strength and conditioning, we apply a deliberate stress and allow the body to adapt positively to that stress. And our mind might go right to our muscles, right? That's what most people do strength training for, but it applies to many more parts of the body than just the muscles. The same can be said for the heart, energy systems, and connective tissue, tendons, ligaments, bone. And it even goes beyond that. Adaptations even occur to our sweat glands and to our skin. Certain motions like zurchers or back squats may initially bruise you, but after a few sessions, you'll find that despite going heavier, you have less bruising. The fact of the matter is, if you apply stress to the body, it will generally adapt if you give it enough time to. Lots of people have concerns based on either their experience level or their age on whether they can adapt to a training stimulus. So I actually have a really quick assessment that can allow you to check to see if your body is capable of adaptation. If you take your first two fingers and place it on your carotid artery, if you feel a pulse, you can actually adapt. It doesn't matter whether you're 70, whether strength training is brand new for you, or you've been doing it for 10 years. If we're smart about applying the appropriate stressor and giving your body time, you will positively adapt. Now, many people might come back with the fact that your discs don't adapt, but let's think about this logically. Tom Stoltman lifted the heaviest Atlas stone ever at over 630 pounds. To pick up an Atlas stone, you have to flex or bend your back considerably, apply that compression to a flexed spine and lift with your back to place that Atlas stone on a higher object. When Stoltman was born, he didn't have discs that were capable of withstanding that kind of force. Forget the muscles, forget everything else involved in actively lifting it. If you were to apply that amount of flexion and compression to his young discs, they would have failed. So the only logical conclusion is that it's not just his muscles that adapted, it's not just his skeleton, but even the discs can adapt significantly to absorb or mitigate forces. And this is crucial to the more 
actionable steps and exercises that I'm going to provide for you today. So many of us have heard, don't lift with your back. And a lot of us choose to believe that. We've hurt our back lifting with it. So it's very natural to want to avoid that. It's a lot like touching the hot stove, right? If you've touched a hot stove and you've burnt yourself, you're going to be less inclined to do that again. But this myth isn't all that different from not letting your knees pass your toes. Lots of people have repeated these old wives tales and have said, you know, don't let your knees pass your toes. It'll increase stress in the knee. And in reality, they're not wrong. The knees passing the toes does increase stress in the knee. But like anything else, when we apply stress to the knee, if we're smart about recovery, the body will adapt to that stress. So it's not about avoiding stress, it's about learning how to manage it and apply it correctly so that our body gets stronger and more resilient. And the back is no different. If we avoid lifting with our back, we'll find ourselves less prepared for our back encountering forces in our day-to-day -day life, particularly when it's flexed or bent. And this is particularly concerning because almost any athletic endeavor involves flexion. If you watch people jumping maximally, they have to bend their spine to do so. Sprinting involves a lot of rotation and flexion of the spine. Throwing, which is a cornerstone to many different sports, involves a lot of flexion and rotation of the spine. So even if we do our best to avoid it because we viewed it like that hot stove, our body's going to encounter that at some point. And this couldn't be more true in the populations that I work with. If you were to watch somebody's spine as they train jujitsu, there's a lot of positions in guard where they get to a very flexed position. And unlike lifting, where you may only get to 50 to 80% of maximum flexion, you'll be pushed to the end points of your range of motion with any joint, including the spine. So if we train jujitsu, it's super important that we can train these different motions of the spine in the weight room and ensure that our body is resilient and capable of dealing with that stress. So at a few different points here, you've heard me mention stress and that this can actually be a good thing, but it's really only one half of the equation. After we apply stress to the body, we wanna make sure that we give adequate time for the body to adapt. We want to allow the body to rest. The relationship between stress and rest is known as load management. And load management is far more important as it relates to predicting injury than specific types of motion. Now, why is that important? There's actually a good amount of data to show that flexion plus compression is a mechanism for injury as it relates to those intervertebral discs. But just because something's a mechanism of injury doesn't mean that we should avoid it entirely. Let's give a different example. If we look at the Achilles, the mechanism for injury is loading and rapid lengthening of that Achilles or calf muscle. So things like jumping and sprinting and backpedaling are actually a mechanism for injury as it relates to the Achilles. So if the answer is just avoiding the mechanism of injury, we would never do those things. But in reality, when we avoid that mechanism of injury, we only leave ourselves more predisposed to injury if we ever do find ourselves in that context. Let me give another example as it relates to a different system of the body. If I had a client that was at risk for heart disease, maybe they had some biomarkers, triglycerides or uh, high blood pressure, um, or a family history that suggested that they were predisposed to a cardiac event. If I wanted the lowest possibility of that individual having a cardiac event while training in my gym, I would just play checkers with them. I would do something that would never elevate their heart rate or stress their heart. And in that moment in time, there would be no increased risk for a cardiac event. But I wouldn't be doing much for them long term. Risk is not the same when we look at short or longer terms, whether we're talking about the heart or any other region of the body. If I wanted to decrease that person's long-term risk, we would have to stress the heart. And in the short term, that would noticeably increase their chance of a cardiac event. But to mitigate that risk, I would focus on one other variable, and that's rate of change. So initially, we would stress that person's heart, but at a very low effort level. And over time, we would create a staircase, small increases in that stressor followed by rest to allow that person's heart to adapt and mitigate or minimize the risk of a cardiac event in the meantime. That example makes sense to most people. And it's really not all that different as we look at training or addressing 
other mechanisms of injury. If we're concerned about our back, or maybe we've had uh, intermittent bouts of back pain in the past, we want to actually directly train that mechanism of injury. We want to flex and compress the spine, but we wanna do so sensibly. We're gonna start slow, and we will look to progress either load or range of motion, little by little, again, following that staircase approach. In doing so, we may have a slightly increased chance of pain in the short term, but what we'll be doing is decreasing our chance of injury in the long term. This is the entire point of strength and conditioning as it relates to injury prevention. Another general principle that I wanna talk about is this idea of wear and tear, and you hear people say it all the time. And wear and tear makes sense. If we look at machines, something like our car, we're aware that wear and tear happens all the time. Your brake pads are a perfect example. As we use our brakes, those brake pads will get thinner and thinner, and eventually, they'll no longer be usable. It's a bit of a problem, though, if we view our body the same way. Our body shouldn't really be compared to a car, and instead, more of an ecosystem. This makes a lot more sense as we start to think of adaptation and load management and all of these other principles that I've mentioned previously. We can apply that stress, and what we're going to do then is allow the body time to get stronger and more resilient. If we wanna to stick to the example of the car and the brake pads, it would be like using the brakes a little bit during the day and then letting the car rest overnight. When we check the brake pads the next morning, it turns out that they're either a little bit thicker or more resilient, made out of some sort of material that doesn't wear down as much. But when it boils down to it, I just don't think that this concept of wear and tear applies to the body all that much. One area where people think that wear and tear does have relevance is with athletes. They love to take some sort of person that trained really hard for a period of time, um, and in their older years, uh, if they have lasting damage, they'll go, well, that person went through wear and tear in their sport. And this may have a little more relevance. When somebody is a competitive athlete, they're not as concerned with load management because they're trying to accomplish a specific task. They're really pushing their body to its limits such that they can achieve a goal within their athletic window. When we don't train sustainably, when we don't take into account load management, that's when some of that cumulative stress can start to accumulate and add up over time. But as long as we keep in mind appropriate progressions and load management, we can really minimize that wear and tear and even have a protective effect on our joints and tissues. So what does all of this mean? First, we want to stress our body in a variety of ways. Two, this stress should increase over time. Three, that increase should take into account rate of change and appropriate rest. And four, if we take into account the prior point, we'll realize that there's no inherently bad motion or stress. So we shouldn't fear anything like spinal flexion. So now let's get into some specific exercises and strategies that you can use as actionable steps to make yourself more resilient. So for any effective strategy, we need a starting point. And if you find yourself either really apprehensive uh, or just a beginner, I would recommend that you start here. These can also be really useful regressions if maybe you're getting to more advanced positions, but you experience some back pain and you know that you can't do the more challenging stuff. So one of the first things that I'm gonna recommend are indirect ways to train and have a positive effect on the spine. One such example would be hip thrusts. With hip thrusts, we don't place a huge load on the spine, but we can train the glutes, which can play a huge role in terms of where our spine is in space and how our pelvis is aligned. Another indirect example are upper body pulling motions. So if we do any sort of row, something that you'll notice is that we can get to a point where our scaps are uh, protracted and have glided forward along the rib cage. As we pull back, our thoracic spine will extend and draw those scaps back. Because there's so many layers of overlapping muscle, if the back pain that we've experienced in the past happens to be in the mid or upper back, these can be great ways to load that region and indirectly have a positive effect on the spine. Other easy ways to get started involve isometrics. If we're holding a dumbbell in just one hand, the muscles along the torso on the opposite side have to work pretty hard to prevent ourselves from laterally flexing. 
So something like suitcase carries, where you just grab a dumbbell and walk around for a set period of time, can be a great regression if we can't actively pull ourselves through a range of motion at that point in time. Other isometrics include things along the anterior side of the body, like planks. Planks require us to use anterior core muscles, primarily our abs, to prevent that lower back from hyperextending. We can also do exercises like Superman cross crawls. All in all, these can be a great place for us to start before we add significant compressive loads. So the first way that I wanna load the spine through a range of motion is one that most people are familiar with. A lot of people have heard that maybe they have back pain because their core isn't strong enough. And while that isn't necessarily how things work, it's not a bad idea to train the muscles along the front side of the body and move the spine through a range of motion. Things like sit-ups or crunches are a way that we can get started, but there's plenty of more advanced ways that we can do so. Um, I like to do ab wheel rollouts and I like to do them a particular way to really get or emphasize range of motion. So I would have somebody start here and start by really rounding that lower back and extending the hips. From here, we have the abs in a shortened position and we go out until the back starts to extend and we get to a much more lengthened position. If we're not advanced, we can just do negatives and crawl back. If you're strong enough, you're more than welcome to get to that extended position and then actively pull yourself back. And it doesn't have to end there. If you're so advanced that you can do full reps uh, for like eight, 10, 12 reps in a set, we can then start to do these from our feet. And it's far more advanced. When you first do this, you'll probably have to do so just with negatives, and then you can progress to going all the way out and back in. There's lots of other ways that we can tax this region as well. Something like a simple toes to bar. Again, if we're newer to this, we can start with the arms bent, which will make it a bit easier. But I really wanna emphasize getting to an extended, or rather starting in an extended position and actively flexing until we get to that shortened position and back using as little momentum as possible. This is a great way to train the abs, but also the lats, which are responsible for other motions higher up in the spine. The next section that we wanna get into is flexion and extension of the spine, but through loading the posterior musculature. And we're gonna, of course, dive into Zercher deadlifts. These have gotten really popular lately, and for good reason, they're a great exercise. What we wanna do to hit a Zercher deadlift is we want to start with a semi-sumo stance. Our feet aren't gonna be as wide as they are for a sumo deadlift, but if they're too narrow, we won't be able to get our arms underneath the bar. So we get to that semi-sumo stance, and we get to a start position with our hips as high as possible. This is actually gonna look different person to person. A lot of my clients, uh, Chance, who's actually shooting this right now, is able to do so from a very high hip position. I don't have the requisite mobility to do that, and that's just fine. We wanna find the highest hip position that we can and perform the motion from there. So for me, I get my arms underneath, I get my hips as high as I can, which is about here. I create tension and complete the lift from here, extending at both the hips and the spine. On the way down, I wanna maintain that high hip position and feel that stretch in my hamstrings and low back to bring it back to the ground. If we can't yet pull from the ground, that's fine. If you're, if you're new to this motion, we can start by either elevating with bumper plates on the ground or pulling from a rack. And keeping in mind some of those principles that we discussed earlier, we don't wanna to have too great of a rate of change. Um, so try not to progress load and range of motion in the same session. Choose one or the other. If you wanna build more mobility and range, you can do that. If you wanna focus on load, you can look to progress that. We wanna really give our body time, especially if this is a newer movement, to uh, allow those adaptations to occur. Another great exercise is a back extension performed on a 45 degree hyper or a reverse hyper extension done on a reverse hyper. Both of these exercises get into significant spinal flexion and extension 
while loading those posterior muscles and even the glutes and hamstrings as well. Another exercise that's worth teaching, the Jefferson curl. And I like to teach that standing up on a box with a kettlebell. This is a great exercise to learn how to begin from a neutral position and segment by segment uh, bend the spine and then the hips in sequence. It's also a great way to build hamstring mobility. And as somebody who lacks uh, a bit of that range of motion in the hamstrings, it's something that I'm using to really start to build that up. Like these other exercises that we've discussed, with the Jefferson curl, I would recommend at first just focusing on the skill acquisition of learning the motion and then looking to progress either range or load in any specific session so that we're not doing too much too fast and leading ourselves to a greater potential for pain. Now the next motion that I wanna talk about loading is rotation. And there are plenty of explosive rotational movements that you can perform with a med ball against a wall. With a lot of these motions, we're not isolating rotation and there's a bit of momentum involved. So in my opinion, I don't think they're the only type of rotational movements that we should do. They're important and velocity is actually something that we really wanna make sure to train. We'll actually visit that in a little bit, but we also wanna to try to hit some rotational strength. Some of us are, are lucky enough to have a selectorized or like Nautilus machine at our gym. But if you don't, I actually, uh, with one of my coaches, uh, Rodrigo, came up with an exercise where we can train rotation in a strength format. So what you'll need is a bench, a cable column. You'll set the cable column to a height where it'll be uh, in line with your torso when you're, sit, uh, when you're seated on the bench. And then we grab one of these tricep ropes and we put it on the cable column. What you're gonna wanna do is let that rope come out and we want to be uh, a little bit further than where that is um, so that we can keep tension the whole time. So what you're gonna do is pull and get some, uh, uh, and get a little bit of slack we're gonna sit on the bench and it, it's usually helpful to cross your feet underneath. Now from here, you're gonna go uh, with the rope over your arm and secure it here. And if you do train jujitsu, like a lot of people on this channel probably do, you're gonna notice that this looks a lot like a heel hook uh, or like one of those twisting looking submissions. I'm gonna bring my other hand here just to keep it tight and isolating rotation of the trunk, my lower body's fixed, my upper body rotates around. We wanna really try to get to the greatest range that we can. And it's a very interesting sensation as you get into it. You obviously feel some abs, um, but there's a, it, it's not really an isolation exercise. We're, we're gonna be feeling everything from our internal and external obliques, even a bit from the lats as we really get into this motion. So if you don't have that selectorized machine, consider giving this guy a try. The next motion that we wanna talk about loading is lateral flexion of the spine. And one of the most efficient, uh, simple ways to do that is just with a dumbbell. We hold onto a dumbbell on one side. If it's really heavy, you could have your arm out to balance. If not, you can just place it on your hip. What we're gonna to look to do is without letting our legs get involved, we're gonna sort of keep them locked out. We let our spine bend as far as it will to one side and then we use the muscles on this side to shorten and pull them back to that neutral position. This is an exercise that works great with a dumbbell. You can also do it on a Smith machine. There's also people who will use straps and do this with a barbell. There's lots of different ways you can load this up and what I would recommend is don't treat this different than other strength exercises. Really try to approach failure. Go until your form starts to break down and challenge those structures. If you want to change the angle here and the active range of motion, you could do this with your feet out and locked in uh, like a 45 degree hyper or a back extension. And that'll change the angle by 45 degrees, loading these muscles at different parts of the range of motion. This is a super useful motion, so don't skip this one.
The next section that we're going to talk about are braced movements. And these are ones that people tend to be very familiar with. These are motions where we want to limit motion of the spine so that we can train usually other parts of the body. These will involve barbell back squats, barbell front squats, uh, deadlifts, RDLs. All of these exercises involve loading either the upper back directly or the upper body through the arms and then bracing through our midsection so that the lower body can really be the engine, whereas these muscles shorten, that force is transferred through our torso and to that weight. Now, like we'll talk about in a later section, there's actually more motion here uh, through our torso than we might at first expect, or even than you might observe if you're watching it. When our hips flex, our spine will naturally flex, and this is fine. But in these motions, we generally practice bracing where we take a deep breath in, we inflate, we compress that, uh, that air, and we limit the amount that the spine flexes so we can effectively transfer force to the implement. These exercises are really important as well. They, they apply a ton of compressive forces to the spine, and that axial load while it can be problematic in an injured population, is super important in terms of creating an anabolic environment in the disc and also stimulating our vertebrae themselves to remodel and get denser. The next section that we wanna look at as it relates to training the spine is different power or uh, movements that train explosiveness. There's a couple variations of a kettlebell swing that we can use uh, to effectively train the spine. One is the traditional kettlebell swing. And even though it looks neutral, there is a bit of motion that occurs throughout this exercise. But this is one where we would start in front of us, generally in what we call the hike position. We would uh, lift the bell and then begin a powerful motion to complete the exercise. I like to coach the kettlebell swing uh, where we keep the elbows close to the side and really push the, the bell back down to that start position. We want to get to deep hip flexion and really allow ourselves to load that entire posterior chain effectively. I'm not a huge fan of letting it swing way out in front of us if the goal is to train the posterior chain and the spine. Now there's another type of a kettlebell swing that we can use for a very unique stimulus. One that you guys might not have seen before. Looks a little bit strange, but I would recommend trying it. And, th and this is the rotational swing. So what we're gonna do here is start our hike position off center. And I'm going to swing side to side, keeping my hips somewhat square and rotating through my trunk. Both of these swings are generally programmed with higher rep ranges and can be very good uh, towards the end of a workout. I don't think that they're gonna provide the same type of stress as some of the more direct strength-based motions that we've gone through previously, but they're definitely valuable to include throughout a program. So there are also more counterintuitive ways to train power that have a very beneficial effect on the spine. And that's with power movements that are ballistic or involve jumping and impact. These impacts over time have a very beneficial effect on those intervertebral discs. And there's data to show that this results in increased disc thickness over time. The last category of exercises that have a positive effect on your discs might really surprise some of you. And that's different forms of cardio. That's right, cardio can actually be very beneficial for disc and spine health. Different types of cardio uh, will directly flex and load the spine, things like your rower or your ski erg. But even more counterintuitive types of cardio, like running, provides a stimulus via impact that creates a stimulus for an anabolic environment in the disc leading to long-term adaptation. So it could be really beneficial to also make sure that you're having some form of regular cardio as a part of your training as well. 
So if you like this style of training and you want it organized for you in a way that really lays out how many reps, how many sets and things like that to help you develop your steel spine, I have a service called Team EP that you can try for seven days free on my training app. Team EP might be marketed towards jujitsu athletes, but you certainly don't have to train jujitsu to reap the benefits of it. Like I said before, it utilizes all of those different types of exercise. And one of the things that we always make sure to prioritize is spine resilience. We also have a Facebook group that gives you access to our coaches, allowing you to upload videos, ask for form checks, and ask any sort of questions that might really enhance your training in any sort of way. So I'll have the link right here for you so you can check out our seven day free trial. And we'd be happy to welcome you to Team EP. So now let's go over some of the research that exists in terms of both misconceptions in the past and what we now know about the spine to make us a little bit more optimistic. I've broken this section down into eight smaller sections or eight points that I think are super relevant. So point one, as we look at literature, is that animal models are often misused and some even show promise. A lot of commonly cited animal studies, like the McGill studies in 2001, are done on motion segments of a dead pig spine. When they repeatedly flex and compress these portions of the spine, they were able to map out mechanisms for disc herniation. And while this is important, we shouldn't extrapolate too much info from these dead motion segments as it relates to our living, adaptable, and interconnected spine. On the flip side, you have some living animal studies done mostly on rats that show that dynamic loading can actually lead to positive adaptations within the intervertebral disc. Dynamic loading is when you go through flexion and compression for a certain period of time, but then you go about your day-to-day -day life. In humans, that would involve us walking around, sitting, sleeping. When we load a segment of the spine for a period of time, but then allow that creature to go about its day-to-day -day life, it creates an anabolic environment where the discs adapt and get more resilient in response to that loading. So it's important to note that when we're looking at animal studies, there's very limited relevance when the tissue being analyzed is dead and can't adapt in any way, shape, or form. But what's reassuring is that when the animal is alive, there's actually various ways that you can place stress on these tissues, like the discs, and it can lead to those discs getting stronger and healthier. So point two is that biomechanical models often conflict with one another. A lot of these models look at stoop lifting, which is essentially lifting with your back, doing an RDL type motion, with squat lifting or lifting with your legs. One of these early biomechanical studies, again by McGill, showed similar compressive forces on the spine, but they showed an increase in shear forces. So the assumption was that maybe these shear forces are more harmful. Interestingly enough, about 20 years later, another study was done looking at similar lifting profiles, and they actually found something quite different. In this study, it showed that stoop lifting had less shear forces on the spine. And when we look closer, these two studies were done on slightly different segments of the spine. The McGill study was on L4, L5, and the 2010 study was done on L5, S1. Overall, this information isn't exactly conclusive. If there's nothing that jumps out or aligns between the two studies, we shouldn't infer anything that causes us to change the way that we move day to day. This conclusion is further supported by more recent data. A study in 2020 showed that even when you try to keep your spine neutral, you'll often flex it up to 20 degrees. So while we do have some control over how our spine moves and our ability to keep it neutral, all that we really have is the ability to prevent endpoint flexion. Even when a spine looks neutral, there's going to be a significant amount of motion through those segments. And this is by design. It's a feature, not a bug. It allows us to move much more efficiently. And this matters a ton in sport and in daily life. What I find super interesting is that there's additional recent data showing that there isn't a difference in disc strain between kyphotic and lordotic postures. And that's great news. We don't really have to perseverate over keeping the spine super straight if it bends as it's supposed to, this is far more natural and allows us to be efficient with our movements. Point three, there's little to no evidence to show that flexion is an independent risk factor for low back pain. 
Interestingly enough, a study in 2014 suggested that lifting load is a potential risk factor, not flexion. And if we refer back to the point of load management that I discussed previously, this adds a little bit of context. In addition, there's multiple studies that show that dictating trunk or knee angle when lifting heavy objects doesn't really validate the myth of you shouldn't lift with your back. This reinforces the idea that our body knows how to pick up the object that we're trying to pick up. There isn't some right way to move that's going to magically spare us from injury or back pain. Point four, and this one's kind of quick, Interventions to change lifting technique aren't all that effective in preventing low back pain. And there's two studies that pretty much demonstrate this fact. Point five should be pretty obvious, and it's that spinal flexion is unavoidable. And in many cases, it's even optimal. I am inevitable. When our spine flexes, if we're trying to pick something up in front of us, it allows us to keep that object closer to us, allowing for much more efficient movement. The Holder 2013 master's thesis, I actually find super interesting. And what that shows is that the spine is flexing even when it doesn't appear to. If you look at the figure that they used for that study, it appears to be neutral, but they actually demonstrate significant degrees of flexion despite that fact. And there's additional data that's really corroborated that. Experienced deadlifters will oftentimes get up to 80% of their maximum spinal flexion. A squat oftentimes involves 60 to 65% of max flexion. Even good mornings, which oftentimes look like a super neutral or lordotic spine, have been shown to have 25 to 27 degrees of spinal flexion, which is about half of maximum. There's a famous McGill study that shows that there's 26 degrees of flexion throughout a kettlebell swing. So why is all this important? When we actually examine how much the spine moves, even when it looks straight, it can show us that obsessing over form isn't really getting us anywhere. Our assumptions in terms of what looks neutral may actually be way off. And instead of being frustrated by this, I actually find this very reassuring. It means that our back is meant to move. Even when it looks like it isn't, it's finding the most efficient way to complete the task. So if spinal flexion is unavoidable, it's something that we should instead embrace and try to get better at. Point six is that many disc bulges and herniations tend to be asymptomatic. Now, despite the fact that this may be scary to some people, I actually find this quite reassuring. It means that even if we do have an injury as far as what would show up on imaging, it may not actually cause problems. This is further supported by data that shows that the size of the herniation doesn't correlate all that much with severity of symptom. And this plays right into point seven, that if you do get hurt, disc herniations can heal or regress. There's actually a ton of data that shows that through the right conservative treatments, herniations and bulges can regress and improve over time. So I find these last two points to be particularly important because if we do hurt our spine, there's a way out of it that doesn't necessarily require surgery. And finally, point eight, you'll see when you're my age, there admittedly isn't a ton of long-term data for spinal flexion, aging, and outcomes, but there is one study that looked at incidences of low back pain with former elite cross-country skiers and rowers compared to non-athletes. And what they found was that after 10 years, there doesn't seem to be a difference in terms of rates of low back pain. So why is this reassuring? We talked about load management earlier, and athletes sometimes don't have load management in mind when they're being competitive. And despite all that, in sports where flexion is a constant, these athletes aren't racked by pain at any sort of rate that's different from the non-athletic population. All of these studies will be linked in the description, and I encourage you to go through each in turn. When we look at the available research, there are obvious limitations. There's things that haven't yet been answered but there really isn't any reason to rationalize avoiding spinal flexion. If we use the techniques shown in this video to train the structures of the spine, there's reason to believe that our body will adapt and leave us less prone to injury in the future. That should be our goal. We should attempt to be anti-fragile and improve the resilience of an area like our spine to the best of our abilities. I really do understand how daunting training our back can be. And I think that this video does a good job of addressing those fears and giving you tools so that you can push against that yourself. If this video helped you, 
please subscribe, like the video, share it with someone who you think it would help. And I promise I'm going to push more. I'm going to create more. I'm going to, I'm going to do more things. Okay. So this video, this video, let's talk about this video. We're going to keep making videos like this and making more of them. Chance is going to help me. He's going to have a lot of work to do. Chance. He's the guy over there. He's really helpful. He deals with a lot of this shit. You know, this should be an ad for Chance. Chance Saller works wonders. This video was fun to make because of Chance. And we're gonna make more like this, me and Chance. We're gonna make them together and bring them to you so that you can benefit. Subscribe, you should subscribe to my channel. You'll like it, I guarantee it. Subscribe, please. I'm gonna cry.